Now the first mistake many business owners make, and it's not just the cake business industry, um, it's just this lack of vision. Now th this is the part of your business planning where you should get very excited, work out where it is you want to be and work, make your plan towards that. And don't get caught up in all this, what Donald Trump or Alan Sugar or all these people might call success. You've got to make success something that's very personal to you. Write it down and create this vision because without this vision, you're not going to end up achieving what it is you really want to achieve. Now, success can be operating your, your business from home. It can be working your business around your children, your family life. It can be having three or four shops in the local town or local towns. It doesn't matter what it is. It's got to be something that you're going to wake up in the morning, be very, very motivated for. And we're going to talk a little bit more about business plans later on. But th this vision is the bit that should inspire you to sit down and do the plan and get the goals that you're after. Now, often use this analogy, it's about the, the captain setting sail from Southampton, heading off to New York. Now, when he sets off, he's got his plan, he's got his route, and he's got all the things in place for him to, to reach New York. So off he goes with this vision of reaching New York. Now, he's got a far better chance of getting to New York than if he set off into the middle of the Atlantic, not really sure where he was going to end up. And of course, as you set off on your business journey, as the captain would um, sailing his ship, you've got all these things that um, are likely to come and sway you off course lightly. So let, let's say that this captain hits a big storm, gets knocked off course. All he does, he sits down, resets his compass, and off he heads to New York again. He might be slightly um, late, there might be other adjustments he needs to make, but he knows where he's going. So it's the same in business. If you know where you're going, you're going to get there, things will happen, you can adjust course, but you know you're going to get there. So this is the vision. And, and it's the good fun part of the business because don't put in any barriers of what might be happening today or tomorrow to restrict you. Think more longer term, think three years time, five years time, or 10 years time, if that's um, what's comfortable for you, but get the vision in place and write it down, make it something that you wake up to every morning and something that inspires you. So hopefully that's been helpful and we'll see you on part two. So the, the second big problem that a lot of business owners fail to, to see or understand is the need for a business plan. Now, it's, when, when you start off, especially with a creative business, the last thing you want to do is to grab pen and paper because most of you are probably sick of pen and paper and you're trying to get away from that type of work. But the, the business plan, the, there are two business plans for me. There's one that you'll write to get funding, the one you, that you'll write for the bank. You know, so that's one plan which can be you know, a 10 to 50 page document and it's full of blurb and graphs and this and that and the other which you will need if you're going to go for funding. And you've got the second one, which is the personal plan. It's the one that you're going to write from your heart. Um, and it can be one or two pages. Obviously, the more information, the better. But don't look at it as this big piece of homework that is going to take you forever to fill in because you've got to do this, that, and the other. You know, obviously, the more you do, the better. But all I would say that the things that you must include are the vision, which was spoken about, your cash flow, which we will speak about, you know, making sure that the, the cash flow is in place because that's the fuel for your business. Um, having a marketing plan and just the, all the specifics of what it is that you're, you're wanting in order to achieve this end, end vision. And put it down nice and easy, something you'll understand and something most importantly that you're happy to pick up at the end of every month and assess where you thought you might be against where you wanted to be and where the actuals have taken you. Now, what we do is we've got a rolling 12 month cash flow marketing and business plan. So at the end of every month, what we do is we add another month on and we obviously lose that month, but we lose the month we've lost. We compare the forecast sales and expenditure against what we've actually done and any adjustments that we need to make there Say, for example, we've added a new um, direct debit, then we need to profile that through the next 12 months because that's going to be coming off. So 
That's more in the cash flow plan, but in the business plan, it's about you setting out some very clear, specific objectives that are going to help you reach your end goal. Now, when I do the presentations, um, usually at Cake International, ask for a show of hands of how many people in the room who are business owners have a business plan. Now, sadly, there are very, very few, you know, two or three percent, probably at most. It's no coincidence that round about the same number of businesses will still be trading in about 10 years' time. Unfortunately, it's a very high casualty rate amongst um, startup businesses, and the percentage that will still be trading um, in 10 years' time is as low as 3 to 5 percent, depending on what reports you, you read. Now, the people that are going to the effort of writing a business plan are far more likely to be in those businesses that are still successful um, in 10 years' time. So that's how important I feel it is. I know it's, it sounds like homework, but if you do it and you just build it into your routine, it becomes part of your process at the end of every month. And believe me, it will add to you being able to achieve this end goal. So please do it. And of course, as a pro member, I'm, Paul and I are very happy to sit down and review your business plans or your marketing plans or your cash flow plans um, to put the experience we've got to try and help you through. Um, and if you are unsure of where to start with it, again, just get in touch. So hopefully that's been helpful and we'll see you on part three. Now, the third reason that a lot of businesses fail um, is the understanding of the old Kevin Costner film, Fil Field of Dreams, If I Build It, They Will Come. Now, I've spoken many times about this and that particular film um, because in marketing terms, it's, it's almost suicide to expect people just to come. So what happens nowadays, people have their Facebook page, their website, and they think, that's it, job done, marketing, um, and they, they, get, they get very upset when people don't come bashing the door down to, to place orders with them. Having Facebook and a website you know, are excellent marketing tools, but really it's all about the business owner getting up, getting out and getting themselves known, especially in the cake industry. You know, you're, most of your audience is going to come, certainly initially, from the local area. So whilst Facebook and websites are, are excellent for grabbing um, large area exposures, the best thing that you can do locally is to, to get in and around your local audience. I mean, it can be anything you know, from business networking, breakfast clubs, any of these things, um, but a lot of them require you to get up, be proactive and go out there. And I know, you know that can be quite uncomfortable. It's very uncomfortable for, for me when I started to do it. You, you had to get up, and the only enticing factor of these breakfast clubs is you get a bacon roll and a cup of coffee. But the negative is it's about 6.30 in the morning. Um, you stand up, you do a short presentation, and, and what happens, all the business owners in the room then become aware of you as the cake person in that area, and you start to get orders and get known that way. Now, if you choose to stay in your bed that morning, you're never going to get out there. So. That there's a lot of knocking on doors, you know, making sure that you can get in and around and, and just making sure that you're, you're presenting your business and the chances for your business in the best possible way. So do not expect customers to come running to you. You go out and find them. Now, once you get these customers, it's all about keeping these customers, getting these customers to refer you and growing the business that way. Facebook and websites, fantastic, but please don't rely on them as your sole area of uh, marketing because you will be disappointed. And you know, back to, to the, the starting sentence, if I build it, they will come. You know, what you really need to do is to build it and get as many people as you possibly can to see it. Um, even if you're at these breakfast marketing clubs or any other, you know, there could be a wedding show, you could be you know, a charity event where you're giving away pieces of your cake um, along with business cards, etc. Everything you're doing is channeling people into you, what we call your sales funnel. So go out and grab them um, and it, you will be amazed at just how easy it is. Once you've done it the first time, you know, it becomes far easier 
and you might start to, to get to enjoy it. And there's nothing more rewarding than standing up, talking about your business, and you get people around the room saying, well, I've, I've had a cake from them, excellent service, loved the cake, and it was an amazing design. You can't, there's nothing you can put in your website that's going to um, advocate your business stronger than that. So build it and invite them along, and if they don't come with an invite, go out and grab them. So look forward to seeing you on the next lesson. So number four is not understanding cash flow. Now, unfortunately, as a business owner, you are 100% accountable and responsible for cash flow. So it is your job to make sure that you're, you're well aware of how the cash flow is operating at any given time. Now, if you really don't understand it at all, you need to get somebody who can help you understand it. You know, you could go to a friend, family member, or get a bookkeeper involved. Somebody will help you explain how the cash flow process works, but it isn't anything more different than how you would run your, your personal expenses or your, your home budget. You know, you have money in, you have money out, and the difference is, um, instead of what you've got to spend in, in business terms, it's your profit. So, obviously, with most household incomes, you've got some reliable sources of income, um, but when you're running a business um, until you've, you, you've built up some trading history, it's a little bit more difficult to, to forecast. So always make sure that you've got some contingency um, money held back just in case. But it is, you know, what we've always done is just run um, month by month, brought in the, the direct debits, brought in other variable expenses, looked at what our cash flow, our sales target should be, and then made sure that there's enough in the bottom, in the bank, to make sure that that cash flow can transition through the month. Now, at the end of the month, as I spoke about when we're talking about the business plan, you would then review your sales expenses and then any adjustments and move on. And it, it really is as simple as that. You know, even when the business get bit, gets bigger, it's just the numbers that tend to get bigger. And you know, the, the amount that you need to leave in the pot gets a little bit bigger. Um, but the mistake that we made when we first started um, trading was we, we started the business in the May time. And of course, with May, June, July, August, September, the sales kept going up. So Paul and I were getting way, way too excited um, because we weren't aware of the seasonality of the business. And then, of course, September, October, November, December, they dropped quite considerably. Um, and at that point, we were absolutely depressed, thinking we're going out of business. And then January, February, it started to pick up. And then in the summer, of course, all shots up to the top again. So, you know, th there is um, a cash flow planning sheet that will be attached to this lesson. And it gives you some of the percentages of turnover that we had in these months. So just work your way through that. And it will take a year or so to build up some reliable figures for you to be able to work back from. But if you're not recording these details now, then you, in 12 months time, you won't be able to look back and start to make some proper assessments. But spend the time getting the cash flow planning right. Just book a day at the end of each month when you're reviewing your plan, review, review the cash flow, and once the job's done, you can forget about it. You don't need to think about it again. And as I said earlier, if you do get stuck, bring in some help, bring in a bookkeeper who can help you out. Um, they would be probably very happy just to set something up, nice and simple, and that's a huge weight off your mind. So. Cash flow planning, very important, and I'll look forward to seeing you now on the next lesson. Now, point number five is about falling out with partners. Now, nobody likes the thought of falling out with partners, but unfortunately it does happen. Now, when you set off in business, it's always going to be more comfortable going into business with a friend or somebody within the industry so as you can share your responsibilities, your good times and your bad times. And it does work very, very well. Obviously, I've been um, in business now with Paul for uh, coming on 15 years um, and it can be very, very rewarding. And we haven't 
had many a crossword because what we've done is we, we set out our roles and responsibilities very, very clearly from the outset. And there are things I don't have any say whatsoever in the, the cake design, uh, which is probably a very good thing. And there are things that um, I have the final say on, um, you know, when it comes to cash flow planning and things like that. There are areas in the middle, um, but each area in the middle, one of us has the directing role. So we're very, very clear on what the roles and responsibilities are. Um, and it's very important to have that laid down. Now, with Paul and I, it's probably a lot easier because I'm not creative and Paul's not um, administratively orientated. So we can have quite clearly divided um, lines here. But if you're in business with somebody who is creative and you, you are having creative challenges, etc., there can be um, areas of falling out. Um, obviously, passion is hugely important. So if you've got passion in there, there's always going to be that tendency. You're always going to want the best for your business and one opinion over another. Um, you know, may have the person who doesn't win that particular argument um, feeling deflated, defeated, and then the negativity can set in. So I would certainly, if, if you are thinking about going into partnership with somebody, I would certainly do it, but lay out the rules right from the very beginning and don't just talk about them, hoping that, that you know, in a year's time, we'll remember everything that was said. Set out a very simple document um, there are things online if you want to grab something online, if you want to take it to another level, if you're going into a limited company or you're, you're maybe looking to invest in shops and property and things like that, then I would suggest that you get a lawyer to, to drop your, your agreement. But once that agreement's there, it means that every, you, both parties are absolutely crystal clear on what happens if... You know, it may well be that somebody or one of the partners wants to pull out at some point for financial reasons, for health reasons, but anything. Um, so what is the exit strategy if that was to occur? Because what you can't have is that if partner number two wants to pull out for financial reasons, we can't have partner one left high and dry. And if you don't have something in writing, then that's exactly what could happen. So getting partners in business, you know, it can be great, very rewarding. You share um, a lot of the workload, the responsibility, the good times and the bad times. But just for goodness sake, make sure that you've got it set out. I know when you're setting this up, the last thing you want to be doing is thinking about falling out. Um, but just think of every eventuality because you're often going into to business with somebody you know very well and what you don't want is that after the business if the business does finish that your friendship or if there a family member ends up um, as a fallout for years and years to come so that can all be sorted out very simply by having the awkward conversation right at the very start so hopefully that's been helpful and we we'll look forward to seeing you now on part six So number six on my list is burning capital or spending lots of money. Uh, now, there are great reasons why you would need capital um, coming into your business, setting up your business, you need capital. If you're going for a, a renovation, a refit, setting up a website, all these things need capital. But what you need to do is to set out your budget right at the very, very start. Um, no matter what the project is, make sure you've sorted out your budget uh, in, in terms of how much money this is going to cost, how long it's going to take, and what the likely rewards are. Now, if it's let, let's use a, a new website as an example. So if you set out your, your budget, you've set out your expectations in terms of at the end of this project, if I spend this, this is what I want to see, and it all has to be working as per X, Y, and Z. So set everything out nice and clearly, set out the time and if these things aren't achieved you, you need to have some um, penalties or some something in place that motivates the people involved in this process to get to that point on budget on time to the specification that you've um, put forward so very often what can happen is that um, you know, in military terms it's mission creep um, but in business terms it's just capital burn um, when 
you get involved maybe in a website, halfway through you decide that you want this added on or that added on, you want it now to be an e-commerce site, you want it to be this, that and the other, and all these things are fantastic, but what you're not doing is going back to your original plan. Um, and you know the developer may be giving you uh, rough quotes on X, Y and Z, and then by the time you get to the end of the project, it's probably doubled or trebled in cost, doubled and trebled in time, and the output that you've got has cho totally changed from the project you started with. Now, I'm not saying that projects shouldn't change halfway through, but you need to go back to the drawing board, make sure that you've got the capital there, make sure that um, the extra time is there and you haven't promised whatever it might be to be done by a certain time. You don't want to be letting your customers down. Now, if you move this into, it could be a, a shop refit, um, anything like that, it, it works exactly the same. Just don't burn your capital. Now, one thing that I always found quite strange, but when I ask um, cake decorators how much they spend on tools and equipment and how much they spend on investing in themselves in their own personal development or business training or cake decorating training. Now, it's strange because so many cake decorators love buying tools, the next gadget, the next thing, the next that. Um, and you're going to, uh, we've got a very good friend who will probably be watching, so we'll rename Nameless. But if you go into her cupboards, you know, that there's tool after tool after tool, and, you know, most of them still in their, their packing, their packaging. So, you know, watching in business terms, if you're doing it as a hobby and that's what you love to do, and you can afford to do it, great, go ahead and do it. But in a business, if you're looking at buying all these tools and pieces of equipment as a capital spend, make sure that that spend is giving you a return on your investment. You know, it's so important that you make sure that uh, everything you do, you're not doing it just because you want to do it, you're doing it because there's a financial benefit. Um, you've got to think of, in business, what are your costs and what's an investment? So if you're buying the next widget, that's the, the next must-have in cake decorating, is that going to cost you or is it an investment because it's going to make you more money because you can do all these extra things with it? Um, that's, that's a question that um, only you'll be able to answer when you look at uh, all the various pieces of equipment that you, you may consider buying. So capital burning, it's, it, it's um, probably the, the sin of shopaholics but uh, anything that you're doing within your business, if it needs extra money, make sure that you write a very, very small project plan um, to make sure that that money is going to give you money back. Um, now, hopefully that's been good, and we're going to now look forward to seeing you on part seven. So in part seven, we're going to talk about people who are really struggling to sell. And you know what we really need to do is to, to change the mindset here slightly, because we have this image of stereotypical salespeople who are in your face all the time. And for a lot of um, maybe more reserved people, that is very uncomfortable. And probably to 99% of the population, it's very uncomfortable. So remove the stereotypical salesperson and just think of you being somebody who's promoting yourself and your products, because that is essentially what you're doing. You're not going to be the in-your-face salesperson, but at the same time, you do need to get out to, to audiences. You can't just sit back and wait for it all to happen. So some of the, 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 the selling techniques, um, a couple of things happened to us. Winter of 2010, it was very bitterly cold and the whole of central Scotland ground to halt because of the, the snow and the ice. And you know we were in a bit of a terrible state. Our cupcake cafe bar had to close because nobody could get in. We had wedding cakes that were being made for weddings that were cancelled. We had wedding cakes that couldn't be made because the designer couldn't get in for weddings that were going ahead. And you can imagine, it was just an absolutely awful time. Now, I could have just sat back in my bum 
and just waited for the thaw to come. But thankfully we had a, a little tiny Peugeot van that would skip over the snow. So I ended up, I get my cake samples, get dressed up into my suit, and off I went in this little van, um, and it just managed to skip over the snow. It was a little front wheel drive van, and off I went round these top five hotels. Um, now fortunately, two of them, the old course hotel in St Andrews and Glen Eagles, both ended up giving us some business off the back of that. Now, that's business that we would never have got if I'd have just sat in my bum and been accepted that the weather had beaten us. Um, and there was another occasion where just being persistent, and I would certainly not class myself as a salesperson, but probably just the persistence um, paid off. And th this was, um, there was a television show called The Hour that uh, started in Scotland, and it was a magazine show, it was on between, I think it was five and six of an evening. And when it first came on, first aired, they had a, a, a cooking slot. And I thought, well, th this would be great just to get in there and see if they would do a cake decorating slot. Um, because it was all about local or Scottish interests. And I thought, you know, it might be good just for them to, to present or for Paul to present something on the show. Now, it took over 10 times for me phoning, emailing, leaving sufficient time that wasn't a complete nag. But um, one of the times I, I was, had a delivery through in Glasgow, so I took some cupcakes along and I delivered them into the Scottish television studios and again, didn't hear anything back. Phoned again, nothing. And then out of the blue, we got a phone call. There's been a cancellation. Can Paul come and do the show today? And of course, I'm on the phone going, yes, of course he can. And Paul was in the background, absolutely panicking. But so I pushed myself into an area I wasn't comfortable with, you know, being, you know, constantly getting in touch to try and get Paul the slot in the show. Paul then had to go on the show, which was very uncomfortable for him to start with. But then we ended up, he got, you know, five or six different slots on that show. You know, so it, and it was all fantastic experience. So these are things that can happen if you're prepared to push yourself outside your comfort zone and make sure that you know you, you put yourself forward for things. Now back into you know your your environments, your your selling environments, if you like. You know, when you've got the, the customer in front of you, you're not trying to sell the cake. What you're doing is you're trying to sell the emotion. You're wanting them to feel good about themselves about the, the, the cake, about their big day. Um, and what they're really in to buy from you is this wonderful feeling that they're going to get when they present the cake of their choice at the, the big event. So don't think of yourself as a salesperson. Don't have these stereotypical thoughts of what a salesperson should be. As a business owner, you've got to get out and promote yourself um, because very few people are going to do it for you. Nobody will do as good a job as you will do at it. And hopefully with these couple of examples of how just pushing yourself a little bit out of the comfort zone can bring potentially huge rewards. So hopefully that's helped and we'll look forward to seeing you now on part eight. So number eight is avoiding the difficult tasks. Now, I'm sure we all do it, or maybe it is just me, but when you open your inbox in the morning, you'll pick off the quick and easy emails to deal with and then you'll probably be left with the ones that have got your head scratching. So then off you go and you're thinking about this for the rest of the day. Now that can, it, it can hold back your creativity if you're carrying baggage around with you in, in, your, in your mind. So what we always used to do with the cake designers when we allocated their cakes out, we would make sure that they tackled the most difficult cakes first in the week. Because if, if for any reason we were struggling for time at the end of the week, it was cakes that were more comfortable and easy to be done. The last thing you want to be doing is trying to learn or doing something really difficult when you're under pressure, because that's when mistakes really start to happen. So that's it for the cake side, but on the, the administrative side or on the planning side, the things that you might put off are the going out to, to visit wedding venues to try and get yourself onto to their wedding show list. Um, 
knocking on doors, go going to uh, school fets, etc., to try and present your cakes or your samples, putting off the, the sales type activities that maybe you feel less comfortable doing. Um, what I would strongly suggest that you do with these types of um, tasks is rather than doing, trying to do them all in a week, is pick off one or two every week. Just have a list. Work out, okay, this week I want to achieve, I need to get my cakes done, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. Take something that's slightly uncomfortable and put it onto your weekly task list. And, you know, it can be about marketing, it can be about tackling accounts, it can be anything. But just start tackling these more difficult tasks. And once the difficult tasks become routine, they no longer become difficult. Because I'll bet you that um, the cakes that you started to do when you first started cake decorating, were it was a complete puzzle. And now you look back and think, well, I can do that in X amount of time, and you don't really need to think too much about it. Well, administrative tasks are exactly the same, and selling tasks or promoting yourself tasks, exactly the same. Once you start to tread that path, it becomes easier and easier and easier. Um, the biggest mistake that you can make is just putting them off to tomorrow. And of course, that old saying that tomorrow never comes. So give yourself some targets, something that's uncomfortable, put it into your, your weekly task list, complete it, and you'll be amazed at how rewarding that feels. If it goes into your task list, you, you complete the task because you've presented yourself to the wedding venue, and the wedding venue say, look, we're completely full, we're not interested right now. Well, don't go back and just rest in your laurels. Try and find somebody else. Try and find a successful conclusion to that task that week. And that will really, really help your business start to grow. So we're now moving on to, towards the end and we'll look forward to seeing you on part nine. A lot of people make the mistake of thinking that business is going to be easy, um, and it can be, but when you first start out, um, there are so many things that you, you need to learn and pick up that it is going to be a steep, steep learning curve. Now, it's how you define that word, easy, because e all easy becomes easy through learning. You know, a difficult task can become easy through learning. So. It's all about how you then approach this, but um, one of the, the big, big mistakes is that people think because they can make some lovely cakes and people will pay money for some lovely cakes, that that's going to be very, very easy in setting up the business. And it can be, of course it can be. If, if your objective, if your business vision and your goal is to be making one cake a week or one cake a fortnight, you know, and it's well within the comfort zone, then you could define that as being very easy as you start up. And that, that can be as, uh, as successful a business to that business owner as somebody who's making 10 to 15 cakes a week is to that owner. But the owner who's making 10 to 15 cakes a week really is going to go on a, a steep learning curve in terms of how to promote your business, getting the business out there, getting cash flow sorted out, making sure that you've got enough orders coming in, making sure you've got enough time to fulfill these orders, making sure that you've got a delivery vehicle in place, and making sure that all that schedule works around all the other things that are going on with you as the business owner at that particular time. So making it easy for me all comes down to planning. You know, if you can get a plan in place, you know, do your best to stick to it, and then review it, learn from it, and change it. Um, but please don't make the mistake of thinking that because you've made some lovely, lovely cakes and some people will give you some money for them, that growing that to, to one cake occasionally to 10 cakes a week is going to be a, an easy transition. Um, once you've done it a few times, as I say, it then will become a bit more standard. You'll be aware and, you know, for, for us, uh, as I said earlier, we've been in business now for coming on 15 years uh, and there are things that we're learning all the time and things are changing all the time. So even if you think you have the knowledge in a particular area, then 
things change and you've got to adapt that. You know, in marketing terms, um, probably the, 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 the thing that's changed most over the last 12 months is Facebook. You know, Facebook used to be a, an excellent and easy way for, um, for us through marketing um, to put forward our tutorials. They changed the algorithm, not only for us, but for, for a lot of businesses, it's a, a lot more difficult to get your posts seen without paying for them. So you're not doing things the way we always did them is now not getting the same result. So you need to change. So we had to go away and research different ways of um, filling that market gap. And you know, if, if you look at it as one big long journey, um, that's your learning journey is never going to end. But the, the vision of your business, which is more of an emotional placement where you want your business to be, you know, you're going to have a, you've got an excellent chance of achieving that, you know, by getting your planning in place. And one of the, the reasons that I mentioned this particular area as number nine is that a lot of businesses fail because the owner goes in thinking it's going to be easy. And they think, well, it, how hard can it be to, to do whatever it is to make this business work? Well, as I say, it is a sliding scale, but don't be under any illusion that it's going to be feet up at seven o'clock on a Friday night um, in the summer. If it is, I would say that you're, you're not stretching yourself enough. Now, business is as hard as you want it to be, um, but don't think that you can just wander in, take over a huge market share, and it will all be nice and plain sailing from the outset. Um, it'll be challenging, but those that overcome these challenges are the ones that are going to, to make a success of their business. And then once it's successful, it does become a lot easier. So hopefully that's helped. And we're now moving on to the final point, mistake number 10. So just to finish now with mistake number 10, you know, having given you some, I'm aware that I've been given some, uh, well, a hopefully useful advice, but it may sound maybe putting some people off um, starting up a business, having covered these 10 points, now the 10th point. Um, what I want to do is finish by talking about the, the thing that you don't do in life is the thing that you're probably going to regret most. Now, it's very easy for people to sit in their armchairs um, and tell other people or to give out their advice on how they should set up their business or they should do this, they should do that, they should do the other, but never actually take the jump to do it themselves. Now, you've got to have the power of your own convictions. You've got to have that little bit of self-confidence. And what you've got to do is, again, pre be prepared to do what most people aren't that prepared to do and jump into business because as soon as you say I'm start starting up a business you then there is a possibility that business could fail and you know but the worst thing to do is to sit back and worry about that better better to try and fail than never to have tried at all and I know I've um, shared my story a few times but you know as, as a civil servant on a very good salary reliable job reliable final salary pension, you know, having a, a good grade. My job was pretty much secure for life and, you know, I could have lived happily ever after. But at the age of 36, I decided to, to hand in my resignation and start up this Cape business with Paul. A huge risk um, and a lot of people just didn't understand why I was moving outside the comfort zone. And yes, for the first two or three years, things were extremely tough. Money was, you know, from not having to consider holidays or spending money on a night out, I had to really rein everything in and, you know, it, it was tough. But I don't think there's a, a day that I look back and wish that I'd never made that jump. You know, there have been times where I wasn't as well off as I would have been um, in my previous job. But it's that piece of rewarding, you know, and, it, you know, Paul and I, we reached a point um, where I remember we, we were on our way back from the lawyer's office in Glasgow. Um, big backstory to that, which I won't go into, 
But um, our lawyer had said, look guys, I think this is time to close your business down. And we came back in that train journey and we didn't speak the whole time. And when we did, two or three hours later, when we did come to it, um, we, we, well, I won't say to camera what we actually said, but it was, no, we were going to beat this. And we worked out how to beat it, and we did. And, you know, it was tough, it was rotten, it was horrible. The things that I've spoken about before, business can be tough and it can be cruel. You know, we felt that what had happened was, was not our fault. Um, but there, there's no point in looking back and blaming anything else on it. We were in that situation. We had to dig deep and get our way through it. But that makes us even more proud now that we've come through that and what we're at this stage. And we're all always continuing to learn. And the one thing about it is that, that there, are, there are no regrets. And whatever I, I do or Paul does going forward, um, I would never move back into that corporate world because I've got far more, there's far more rewarding doing something for yourself and having that bit of pride and just, you know, sitting back and, you know, lo looking, looking yourself in the mirror and saying, well, right, we've, we've done this or I've done this or you've done that, you know, rather than being very proud of what your corporate organisation might achieve, you're very proud of what, what you've done or your contribution towards this part in business. And it doesn't have to be, um, you know, the biggest cake franchise in the world. Um, it's whatever you feel that it should be. So don't look back with any regret. If it were me, I would get the plan in place and do it. And, but just be prepared that um, you know, it, there are going to be some rocky times. And it's how you deal with these rocky times as an individual, as your business, that will, will either see you through or, or otherwise. But uh, the, the, everything's there. For, for you to go and make a go of it. And I think it's, it's the, the most rewarding thing in the world. It can be the most challenging, but just to finish by saying, just do it and don't be full of regrets of wishing at some point later in life that you had. So that's me finished with the top 10 mistakes that cake business is make or cake business owners make and how to, to fix them. So hopefully the, 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 the fixes have come through a lot stronger and louder than the mistakes have. Um, and as always, just pop any questions in the box below and we'll get back to you. And as I said earlier, if you would like um, Paul and I to review your business plans, then you know there's an open door, just email me at david at designer-cakes.com. So we'll look forward now to seeing you on the next lesson.